So welcome to part two of our three-part video series. The first part focused more on the biology of viruses. Now the second part is focused more on understanding epidemiology, the spread of infectious diseases, and how some of those concepts relate to what we're seeing today. Now, just as a reminder, I just want everybody to remember that one, all of these videos were shot towards the end of March, but second, nobody in these videos focus on studying the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, however, everybody in this video studies topics that are very important to understand for what's going on in the world today. So with that in mind, a friend of mine, Christina Series, will be going over some of the basic concepts behind epidemiology, and then we'll go into our Q&A panel with our two Cornell epidemiologists. So Christina, if you won't mind, please take it away. Epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of health-related states. An epidemiologist may study the influence of environmental, socioeconomic, demographic, and health factors on the dynamics of a disease in a population. Infectious disease epidemiology is the branch of epidemiology that focuses on the study of factors related to the distribution, spread, treatment, and control of an infectious disease in a population. You may have heard of r naught or the basic reproductive rate. r naught measures the number of secondary cases that are caused by an infected person. Basically, if you're infected, on average, how many people will you infect? If r naught is greater than one, each existing infection will cause more than one new infection. This leads to exponential growth in the number of infected people. If r naught equals one, each existing infection will produce one new infection. In this case, a disease can persist in a population, but there won't be exponential growth in the number of new cases. If r naught is less than one, each existing infection will cause less than one new infection. This outbreak will not grow quickly and will eventually die out. r naught depends on three things. First, transmissibility. Second, contact between susceptible and infectious individuals. And third, the duration of infection. If you decrease one or more of these factors, r naught also decreases. Right now, we don't have any tools available to decrease the transmissibility or shorten the duration of SARS-CoV-2 infection, the cause of COVID-19. We do, however, have the ability to decrease contact between susceptible and infectious individuals. This is why we are social distancing right now. If we are able to minimize the contact between healthy and sick people, we will decrease r naught and therefore decrease the number of new infections caused by each person who is currently infected. All right. Once again, thank you, Christina, for taking the time to film that. I genuinely appreciate it. Now, next up, we have our Q&A session with our Cornell epidemiologists, Dr. Renata Ivanik and Dr. Karen Havis. Really can't describe how fun it was to record this kind of panel interview with these two professors. Both of them were very enthusiastic, feeding off of one another. And these two professors really went above and beyond in order to put this video together. So I really hope you enjoy this. And without further ado, let's move on into it. Thank you all for uh, agreeing to meet with me on this lovely day inside. Uh, first, could you all please introduce yourselves and say your name, your department, and your university affiliation? My name is Renata Ivanek. I'm an epidemiologist at Population Medicine and Diagnostic Sciences at Cornell Vet School. My name is Karen Havis. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist in the Masters of Public Health program at Cornell University, although these views are my own. And I'm also in the Pop Med and Diagnostic Sciences group. Same here. These views are my own. Are all right. So we have a handful of questions regarding COVID-19. So I'm just going to walk through them one by one and you all can provide your feedback and opinions. So the first one that we have is how does COVID-19 compare to the swine flu pandemic of 2009? And how may some of these differences contribute to some of the uh, panic that we're currently seeing today? I was thinking about that, and I'm thinking that there are perhaps three main differences, and they are in terms of transmissibility, severity, and population susceptibility. So in terms of transmissibility, COVID spreads better. If you, if you think about transmissibility in terms of basic reproduction number, it is higher for COVID than it was for swine flu. And it, the number doesn't seem that much different. So it's 1.3 for swine flu, approximately 1.3 versus somewhere around 2.3 for COVID. But it does, at the population level very quickly escalates into much larger uh, larger outbreak in terms of severity again 
COVID is worse. There are different reports from different parts of the world. In some places, fatality or case fatality in terms of number of people who died among those who have been infected is slower, in some places higher. WHO said it's about 3.4%. So it was not as high. It was, I think, about 1% for swine flu. We always, we, we keep talking also about Spanish flu, which was our like a big scare. And we always thought as long as nothing as bad happens, we'll be okay. For Spanish flu, according to some accounts, it was up to 5%. So 3.4, if that's what it's going to be for the world, is it is coming closer to the 5%. Um, and then in terms of susceptibility, maybe this is one of the main reasons why this is uh, causing such a great panic with uh, swine flu, some portion of population had some level of immunity through cross protection from other influenza that they had over life. And specifically older generations, large proportion of them had that protection. So more younger people were getting affected. In COVID, nobody has any protection whatsoever. So we are totally naive. There are some speculations that maybe there is some protection from previous SARS outbreak, but that's it. And so everybody feels vulnerable. And those who have comorbidity, or have or are older or even male, even this here that male compared to female are, are more likely to have more severe outcome. Like everybody is super scared. So thinking that those three factors and maybe the last one contributing the most why we have this sense of panic. Yeah, I would, I would echo a lot of those, so I won't necessarily repeat them. I think the additional reasons we're seeing panic with COVID is kind of twofold. One, it's new. Everybody heard of influenza. We don't take influenza nearly serious enough as a disease as it is. We have methods to deal with it through testing. Testing is readily available for influenza through public health labs, through private labs, at hospitals. That infrastructure is already in place. So we typically also know our burden of influenza quite well. And we have a vaccine to prevent it. So it feels like less of a threat than it actually is. So speaking to ability to assess risk, people underestimate influenza. You know, just anecdotally, you hear people like, oh, it'd be great to get the flu, then I could sleep on the couch all week and I'd be fine. And the people who get the flu are like, that was really awful and I'm getting my flu vaccine next year. So I think part of it is H1N1, it was a much more slowly moving virus its serious impacts were on a lesser portion of the population, and we were very familiar with it. It was influenza, so why is that so scary? It wasn't the death rate of the bird flu, H5N1, which really didn't become a pandemic, so didn't garner the attention. So we don't really have a lot of respect for influenza as it is. The 1918 flu, or you know, the misnomer being Spanish flu, it probably came out of Kansas, um, was what we're looking at now, more deadly, more transmissible, more spread. But we don't really have an appreciation of that. So I think that's one reason, just the familiarity of it. The other with COVID, the panic with COVID, I, I think there's two camps with COVID based on talking with students and talking with people. There's a number of coronaviruses. You know, the best analogy I've heard so far is that there is a group of dogs, but there's a number of breeds of dogs and each breed has its the own way it behaves. Well, there's one strain of COVID that causes the common cold. It might cause a medium to moderate upper respiratory infection where you get a cold. And some people are aware of that because if you look at, you know, household products, it says it on, it kills the common cold viruses such as coronavirus. And then people who feel like they're not going to get the severe disease are underestimating it. And that's why we're seeing this failure of social distancing. So there's almost not enough panic in the right populations, but the reality is the healthcare field and the public health field and the medical and health professionals, yeah, we're a little panicked. We definitely don't think this is a human apocalypse, right? This is not going to wipe out humanity. 80% of people infected will get an unfortunate illness and recover cover and be fine. The panic that we're seeing is really about uh, the severe disease in the very small portion of the population. And the death rate, I think we don't know what it is. And that's what's scary. Um, and it has to do with testing. So this lack of knowledge around this virus and this lack of knowledge around its expression in the population, I think that leads to a lot of discomfort and a lot of concern. And when you don't know something, right, like when something's new and scary and you don't know enough about it, it leads to concern. And we are overwhelming our health infrastructure. So the reality of that concern and not knowing what to really expect, but to know it's going to be bad, and then already realizing that we're making masks, that we're running out of ventilation that we are already there and we still don't know what to expect definitely leads to panic. I mean, the epi of it is scary, I think, to, to my perspective. But I, I also think that disconnect between the people who are nervous and the people who are not creates an added level of anxiety for those of us who are like, this could be bad. Please stay home. 
that actually provides a perfect transition to our next question, this idea of staying home. You had mentioned social distancing. One of the questions we got are, what are some strategies that can be used in order to combat the spread of infectious diseases within a population? Doesn't necessarily have to be COVID per se, but just, you know, what are some strategies that we can take? Yeah, this is a great public health program question. One thing that Renata spoke to earlier was something called the reproductive number. In an outbreak, technically it's a secondary attack rate, but it's the number of people and in infected person will infect. So that is made up of the number of contacts you have in a unit of time, the probability of transmission in a unit of time, and the duration of infection in that unit of time, which is a little more theoretical. So the goal in most public health interventions and infectious disease interventions is to reduce those three things. So if you can reduce the number of contacts you have in a unit of time, you reduce spread of disease because that's one of the three components. So what we're seeing with social distancing is if I don't contact 10 people, then I take away the probability of infecting 10 people, right? So if I can only contact one person or two persons, then I'm not going to spread disease. So public health intervention, number one is distancing. So if you're sick, stay home. Bottom line, I don't care if you have the flu. I don't care if you have a GI illness. I don't care if you have a cold. If you stay away from people, you won't spread the disease. The probability of infection is another thing we can reduce. So washing your hands. If you if you reduce the, the pathogen load that you're carrying around, you're never going to get it to zero. But if you wash your hands, your probability of spreading it to the next person is lower. If you go to the doctor's office and you're coughing and you wear a mask in your doctor's office in that enclosed space, that can reduce the spread of infection to other people. The, the masks are best when you are sick to protect other people. Um, if you get vaccinated, if there's one available, well, that reduces somebody's probability of giving you disease. If you get treated when you there is a treatment available, that reduces your duration of infection and the time that you're infectious. So it's those three components we're working around, and there's lots of interventions that we can do within each of those to reduce our infectious and to reduce our risk of spread. Yeah, I agree with everything. I would... Perhaps just also add the, this particular disease seems to have also environmental spread. It's not clear how important it is to spread compared to person to person directly. I come and then I sneeze and then I infect three other people around me. But what is the importance of services that were in the place where I sneeze and now those services are contaminated? And those services could be contaminated, it seems, based on recent research up to three days, maybe even longer for some extreme cases. And so I don't even meet in person those other people. People and I could still spread infection. So that adds another level of complexity, but also opportunity for us to react. If from a perspective of an infected person, anything that I'm touching, it would be important even to disinfect. But for, and also from a perspective of a susceptible person, whatever I'm touching, and then if I have a habit of touching nose, and if we actually have habit of touching nose and face quite a lot, and we, I think we all became aware of that, how often we do that uh, all the time. So I, how often I do that, that creates then the need for washing hands. So washing hands absolutely is a way to prevent spread from person to person, but also through those contaminated services in public places or even in doctor's office or the doorknob. So that's why we are nowadays quite eager to dis disinfect those frequently touched surfaces. All right. Uh, that's all of the questions that I have from people. Um, is there anything else that you all would like to highlight that you think would be relevant? Um, the one thing I, I, we've started discussing is how are we going to get out of this? How long is this going to last is a common question I get. And to be honest, I don't think anyone really knows. Places where they tested a great deal and they've done the social distancing, it's taken them three or four weeks to hit their peak of cases and then they're starting to come down. I think we're looking at more than two weeks is what I would say, because everybody's done this two week pause. And I think we need to be prepared for this to be much longer than two weeks. And then I think the society needs to be prepared that often when there's a new disease, there's a spike and then it comes down, but as it becomes something you call an endemic state, where it becomes just part of your normal disease patterns in your country, you're going to go through some smaller and smaller waves of disease. And I don't know what those will look like. I couldn't even begin to tell you. I don't know how long they'll last, and I don't know the severity and if we'll need to flatten any of those curves too. But it's likely not going to be something that we come out of and just kaboom, go back to normal life. And we need to be prepared that we're going to have to change some of our patterns potentially for a longer period of time. And I don't say that to be a killjoy or to 
damage the economy. But just I think it's better to prepare people for the longer term expectation than to say, in two weeks, we're going to be back to normal. Or by Easter, we're going to be back to normal. It, this is going to take a little bit of time. Yeah, I agree with that. And maybe I would connect that. Earlier, we talked about panic and also that not everybody is panicking. So who are people who are more, more anxious and who are those who are tending as life is as normal, not even implementing control strategies? Definitely is, is a question for a sociologist. But just observing, it seems that who is worried and who is not depends on age, depends even on political denomination, like which political party do you buy to, all kinds of factors. And it's some kind of unity there it would seem to be important so that we share similar perspectives and attitudes towards control, so that we don't have some who are going out of their way to control infection as, and then those who do not share th- those views. And then everybody's entitled to their own views, absolutely. But uh, in, in case of a crisis like this, that is not only national emergency, but it's pandemic, trying to get to together with views might be uh, really good for our opportunity to control the infection. I guess um, the very last thing I will say is if anyone's listening to this and they're not social distancing and they don't think this is serious, this is a serious thing. And the more we take care of each other and the more that we stay at home, the less people that will actually die or the less people that will have long-term lung and heart issues, and the less people that will go bankrupt due to medical bills. This isn't a disease just of the old. It's affecting a lot of people. And we really it's one of those things where we really are all in it together. Okay, so, so let's do it. <laughs> all right, yeah. So I guess... Uh... Final last thoughts. Everybody nowadays, well, many people nowadays talk about the importance of testing. Should we do it? Should we not? It deserves some of our attention, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Perhaps we can just generalize first and say that testing can be done in order to identify infected people or end to identify people who have developed immunity and are no longer in the susceptible pool. And then both of them would be important in their own right. Obviously, if you find as many infected people we can find in real time, the more we can isolate them and, and break that chain of spread that we talked about. So that definitely will be very helpful. On the other hand, identifying those who develop immunity, who have already recovered, then we know what our pool of susceptible is. And then we can start making better prediction even how w- vulnerable are we we still how large peak in, in new infections we, we could expect and then mathematical models that have been developed could get better interpretation better prediction so testing in epidemiology for control of any infectious disease is an important component I think what you've seen has been the virus has moved faster than our algorithms for diagnostics. And it's not unusual in the start of a disease or very early or when there's very little disease to have a more stringent case definition, which is what we saw early, right? Like they had to have this very specific fever and they, or they had to have a clear contact. Or, and unfortunately, this virus moved faster than that case definition. So while we still treated it like a travel associated infection and we were diagnosing it or using our diagnostics, which were really limited based on that, the virus became community spread. So one of the major challenges in public health, I think, is to keep up your testing algorithms and when you use them with the virus. And we clearly fell behind. And we fell behind for a few reasons. A, I think we didn't contain it, and that's going to happen. There's this transition from containment to to mitigation, but that's going to happen. So case definitions very quickly have a lot of false negatives with them. I don't remember what the case definition was, but you know, if somebody came in with a degree of 100 degrees Fahrenheit and the case definition said you had to be 100.4, well, it's so stringent now that you're missing so many cases because there's community spread. So you you believe positive tests more, like right? they call that positive predictive value. So with our diagnostics, we quickly fell behind because we, it quickly went from being contained to not contained. And then on top of that, the testing shortage didn't help. Even if we changed definitions, we couldn't keep up. And in the way that when there's a new disease and we 
create diagnostics for it. Like the CDC created this test. They actually get a waiver, right, from the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration to say, okay, an emergency use authorization that allows them to very, very quickly evaluate the test and say it works. So there's all these steps that go through this. Now companies are doing that, right? Like all these companies are probably going through that process with the FDA and getting emergency use authorizations. And they have to show at least some level of efficacy. But we, what we're seeing now is now it's not that we don't have a good definition. It's that because now they're like, well, any symptoms or any exposures, theoretically, you can go and get a test, but we don't have nearly enough. And so what it leaves us is the test I'm talking about is the one that looks for the virus, the one look, that looks for the nucleic acid of the virus, not the one that looks for the antibodies. Because currently, it'd be nice to know who was exposed. But if we want to stop the outbreak, I want to know where the virus is. So I want the nucleic acid one. So that's the one we're short of. And now companies are ramping up and that's great, but now we're, we're, now we're behind. So it's really hard to control something when you don't know where it is. And as someone once explained viruses to me a long time ago, they're tiny little guys that you can't see. They're kind of like ninjas. They show up everywhere. They disappear. They infect you before you know it and you're shedding before you know it. And then they take you out. They're really difficult to keep up with if you can't run the diagnostics on potentially anyone who might've been exposed or anyone with any kind of symptoms. So that's where we're at with the diagnostics is not only is it leaving us a gap in, in knowing who our infected are, but it's leaving us a gap in our response. Yeah. So, and I, I think I would just add to that diagnostic tests are rarely perfect. We love them to be perfect, but more often they're not, they are not perfect. And so sometimes they have false negatives. Sometimes they have false positives. The ones that PCR, that uh, CDC developed is really good in both of those aspects, sensitivity and specificity, at least based on the data that I was able to see. But False positives and false negatives are possible. And this is opportunity to be, to also, and maybe also the need to educate public. What does it mean? Can we miss a positive case? Or can we falsely, can we identify a case that actually isn't a case? With the identification of person that has recovered, it might there might even be more opportunity for false discovery, whether it's false positive or false negative. Again, it's important to keep that in mind. The other real key to that is, you know, we've been testing people who've been travel and coming home. And the challenge to that is you have to catch them when they're shedding. So it's not just one test. It might be three tests to catch someone who, who you know was exposed until you catch them as positive. So it gets even more complicated when you start testing exposed people because now you're playing the game of, well, here's the average incubation period, the time of exposure to the time of clinical signs, or the latent period is the time of exposure, the time of shedding of the virus. Here's the average one, but here's the, the range. And if you're not picking up a positive, you've got to test through the range at, at certain intervals. So it's easier if people just stay at home when they're exposed. And that's why they're saying, if you've been exposed, you know you've been exposed, don't use up the tests, just self-quarantine, because you would have to keep testing through that range. And what's the benefit? Because it could be up to the very last day of your quarantine period. So this is why things get very complicated and it requires a lot of social commitment to, to control this disease. Yeah, and that actually reminded me, and maybe it goes without saying, but once the infected, the one that is shedding is identified, it's not just uh, identify that person and putting in a safe place where other people cannot be infected in the future, but it also gives us opportunity to trace back with whom has that person been in contact. So it allows us to swiftly identify quite many ex potential exposures and then quarantine them until we see whether they are de going to develop an infection or not, or even just as a precaution, as Karen just said. So testing and identifying infected really is a powerful tool. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you all very much for coming back out here late at night and as well as donning on the clothing from yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate the commitment. So yeah, thank you very much. You're oh, very welcome. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks, Renata, for bringing that up. So that was part two for this three-part video series. If you want access to the other two videos, go ahead, find the link in the description down below. And with that, I will see you next time.